Hey, happy Friday. This week we'll talk about Google announcing that they want to stop tracking you for personalized ads. We'll talk about Samsung becoming weirdly the best smartphone OEM for Android updates. And we'll also talk about the metric ton of new gadgets, including the world's first carbon fiber smartphone. We also have a new weekly tech knowledge quiz with 20 brand new questions to test your tech knowledge on and a fancy dynamic link that either opens the quiz in the Android app or on the web, depending on where you are. Check it out. It's magic. And welcome to the Friday Checkout. Okay, my first story of the week will be about Google starting to test federated learning of cohorts. It's fancy new tracking technology that I will call Flock from now on, which Google says is a super privacy respecting alternative for user tracking and many others say is a monopolist further strengthening its monopolies. The concept behind Flock is that people don't like websites tracking what they do and especially not when advertisers follow them across websites with things like third party cookies. All major web browsers have started blocking those by default a few years back, except Google's Chrome, of course, as tracking you across sites is Google's primary source of revenue, but they too have committed to doing so in the future, so they need an alternative way to track users. And that alternative is Flock. Instead of relying on websites to track users with third-party cookies, Flock basically makes Chrome itself do the tracking. It checks what sites you visit, runs that through machine learning algorithms, and tries to determine your interests out of that. Like maybe you are still obsessed with Windows Phone, love vintage cars, and have an obsession with weekly tech knowledge quizzes, for example. Chrome then puts you into a bucket with other people who like the same stuff, it calls that a cohort, assigns that cohort a special ID, and whenever you visit a website, it lets advertisers see that ID through an API so they can show you ads based on your cohort ID rather than your own personal data. The huge potential benefits are that all the tracking and all the analysis theoretically happens locally on your machine. It doesn't get uploaded to like 50 different web servers that do the analysis and retain the data and that you can never have control over and forget where they are and all that kind of stuff. It's on your device locally and theoretically, the only thing that you send out to, for example, advertising networks is your cohort ID, not your entire personal history. Google also says that already now, Flock is 95% as effective at targeting ads as personalized tracking, so theoretically, people could keep their privacy cake and advertisers could still eat their revenue cake. Which all sounds really damn good, except I can think of at least three massive problems that this new system could introduce. First, under Flock, the web browser could theoretically start tracking your activities across all sites, not just those that have decided to add Google tracking to them. Second, if Google blocks all third-party trackers, but builds its own tracker into the world's most popular web browser itself, that would leave any competing ad networks vastly disadvantaged, meaning Google could end up being the only major third-party ads provider on the web. And third, if the efficiency of Google Ads get tied to the Chrome browser, you bet many websites will simply refuse to work in anything but Chrome soon, causing an even stronger monopoly in the browser space as well. Flock is still in its early phases and Google is still changing its mind about what to do with it, so details are scarce and nothing is final yet, but it is shaping up to be hugely important. Competitors and regulators are understandably paying very close attention to what is happening with Flock. And if you haven't seen my latest video on TechAltar breaking down GDPR, where it has succeeded, where it has failed, maybe you want to watch that for some more context. All right, on to my second topic of the week, which is going to be Samsung being on track to becoming basically the best Android smartphone maker when it comes to software. So earlier this week, a Dutch website called galaxyclub.nl spotted on a Samsung support page that the upcoming A52 will be Samsung's first A-series consumer phone to start receiving monthly security patches. Samsung has since removed that phone from that list, I guess because it hasn't actually been announced yet, and it seems like an oddly specific detail to be excited about, but I think given the context here, it is really important news. Just two weeks ago, Samsung has confirmed that it would bring four years of security patches and three major Android updates to all of its flagship phones and even the A and M series phones that have been released since 2019, which Android Central points out is actually more than even Google promises for their Pixel phones. And now it seems like they're gearing up to improve the frequency of updates on cheaper phones too, like they have already done on flagships. Security patches have been super timely on both of my Samsung 
iPhones since I bought them. One UI 3.1 is being rolled out at lightning speed to older phones too, backporting all of their newest features to older phones. I mean, even my one and a half year old Galaxy Note 10 got it over a week ago already. And we've even seen that One UI's design has inspired Google's Android 12, which comes with a one-handed friendly UI mode that will look eerily familiar to anyone using a Samsung phone. All of which is to say that the transformation Samsung has gone through over the last couple of years is quite amazing. They went from being one of the worst companies in the industry to becoming one of the best, at least when it comes to software updates. I mean, mid-range Samsung phones with four years of monthly updates and all the new features being backported from the flagships in a timely manner, plus a trend-setting design sounds oddly fantastic, especially for Samsung. I just wish the next thing on their agenda was stopping to push ads in their UI. All right, and for the third segment this week, I'm trying a little bit of a new format for this show. I'm calling it Release Highlights, and here's the idea. Last Friday, we started publishing this little thing on our blog. It's a really concise list of all the gadgets that were released in a given week with some basic info like price and where it was launched and a link to either an article or a product page where you can learn more about it. So once a week, you can come here and keep track of all the new stuff that was launched. We're calling this the release monitor, it is linked down in the description, and every Friday I'll pick what I thought were the most interesting releases on the list, and this week I'm gonna start with three picks. First, the Realme GT, which launched in China this week, starting at a ridiculously low price of 2,800 yuan, or about $430. That's for a phone with all the flagship specs, including a Snapdragon 888, a 120Hz OLED screen, 65W fast charging, and even a headphone jack, meaning that if this ever comes out of China, it is shaping up to be an absolute flagship killer. Second, we have the Redmi Note 10 Pro, which launched in India starting at around 220 bucks, offering a 120Hz AMOLED screen, a Snapdragon 732 chip, and decent looking cameras and battery tech for the price. Again, just insane value and a painful reminder that India and China gets all the best phone deals. And third, a phone that I, for a change, actually have a review unit of, called the Carbon One Mark II. It's the first phone of a Berlin-based startup called Carbon Mobile, and it's definitely not for the spec hungry, as it comes with a pretty ancient MediaTek P90 chip and an eye-watering 800 euro price tag. What makes this phone interesting is that this is the world's first phone that is actually made with real carbon fiber, not some plastic lookalike. That is no small feat as carbon fiber normally blocks radio waves, so they have to do a ton of custom engineering around that. The carbon fiber chassis gives the phone its structure, so there's no need for a metal plate inside to hold all the components in place like with other phones. The phone is crazy light at 125 grams, so it weighs less than even an iPhone mini despite being significantly bigger and I got to make an interview with the founder. So if you want to know more about them, I've linked to that in the description as well. I doubt most of my viewers will want to buy a phone for 800 euros with specs like these, but especially as a company man and as a Berliner, I'm always fascinated when companies try to do something new and crazy, especially when they are from Europe. So I'm quite fascinated and these are my three picks for the week. Again, you can find the full release monitor in the description, including laptops, drones, basically anything that's interesting at a glance, including regional launches. And if you think we've missed anything, let us know by tweeting at CrowdApp and we'll be sure to add it. All right, I hope you like this new format. Let me know what you think about it and I'll see you next Friday.